On today's episode, we're going to talk about how to increase your communication skills, your typography skills, and how to find clients on Instagram. Let's rock and roll. Hey, everybody, what's up? And welcome back to another episode of Ask Run. This is the third Ask Run episode. As always, if you want to drop in questions for this show, make sure that you follow up on Instagram and I post there kind of questions and ask for questions to be posted. And if you want to ask a question, that's the best way to do it. Let's get started on today's questions. How to improve your communication skill as an introvert um, in meetings and presentations. So I think this is something that I struggled with a lot. I wasn't always good at talking to camera and talking with to clients in, in scenarios like meetings and presentations and stuff. And I find two things that really help me out. So the first one is to write down your thoughts. So writing in general really helps you to clarify your thoughts. So when you put things down on paper, and it can be as much as bullet points, you don't have to write the whole speech. But if you write bullet points, it really helps you to clarify what you want to talk about. Then step number two of the process is practice in your head. And for me, the best time that I always do this is when I ride my bicycle to a meeting or to a presentation, I actually practice what I'm about to say in my head. And there is research that's showing that practicing in your head is exactly like practicing in real life. This is actually pretty crazy. They did this experiment where uh, basketball players had to like half of the group actually practice shooting and the other half just stayed at home, closed their eyes and imagined they're shooting perfect scores um and they they both improved in the same quality in this in the same you know as much so practicing in your head it really really helps so if you tell yourself if you imagine yourself presenting and you speak out loud in your head when you get into the presentation it won't be the first time that you're doing it so you have practice you'll have more confidence you'll know what you're talking about and that's the way to build confidence of course just like anything when you you're building confidence it's a lot of practice start small and then you'll get better you'll get better with every meeting that you're doing this but two key takeaways write down your thoughts and then practice them in your head before the meeting next question how to find clients through instagram UI, UX, and web design. So I think the goal here is to understand that you can find clients if you are making content for clients on Instagram. However, most designers that I see on Instagram are actually creating content for other designers. And that is a mistake because your client, I see a lot of, of course, carousels and you know uh, education posts are now very popular on, on Instagram right now, but they are teaching designers how to design. And your clients are, or potential clients are not even actually care about that. They don't care how about how to, you know, do better UI or design buttons or something like that. So you have to think about their perspective. And this comes back to really understanding who your customers are. So if you work with restaurant owners, for example, you might want to create something that answers their problems. For example, how to create better, how to how do you judge a good restaurant website or three things that all restaurant websites should have. If I'm a restaurant owner and I suddenly see a post like this on my explore page or by using using the relevant hashtags for restaurant owners. Again, nothing to do with design. When I see that as a restaurant owner, I'm like, mm, that's interesting because I'm a restaurant owner. I have a website. I want to know how to make it better. And then I start following this person and I see he's bringing me a lot of value, teaching me how to build a better restaurant business using design. I'm going to follow this. I know this person now and I trust him. That's more likely. Um, he'll probably click to see my profile. If you'll see relevant work, he might hit me up for work. So keep in mind, understand who your who your ideal client is. Of course, never say something like everybody. My ideal client is everybody. Be very specific and then create content to build trust with them, content that is valuable for them. You're not here to impress other designers because they're not going to translate into paying customers. Next question, solo designer versus an agency, how to compete. So the first thing I think you should think about that is you're actually not always competing with agencies because different clients have different preferences. Clients that are bigger clients and usually would hire an agency and they know they want to hire an agency. So they're only going to be talking to agencies and they're not even going to consider working with a freelancer because they probably have, you know, that that feeling or thought that they're not going to be able to fulfill their demands. They have too much demands. They need, 
you know, versatility or a big team to work on their project. So they know they want to work with an agency. So you you don't compete. Other clients know that, you know, they don't want to work with a big office with a lot of people. They want to work directly with the person that's working for them. So they're only going to interview um, freelancers. So a lot of times you're not even competing with with agencies. If you're a freelancer, you know, you usually compete with other freelancers. However, sometimes clients are on the edge where they don't really know which one they prefer. It's not very common, but sometimes that happens. And in that case, you need to remember what you do better than an agency. So yeah, an agency might be bigger, they might have a fancier office, they might have a bigger team, they might have a bigger portfolio. However, the fact that they are big means that they, they're probably way more expensive, right? They have to pay for all this office. They have to pay for all their staff. They have to, they have a much higher expense expenses, so they have to charge higher prices. Because they are, are bloated, probably the client will have to work with a project manager and with there, there is gonna be a lot of kind of bureaucracy before he the, their feedback is getting into the designer. And a lot of times what what clients will be interested in is working directly with the person because they know that the, the turnaround can be faster, the feedback can be more accurate. You actually get a, a better service by working with a person directly by the way, that's not always freelancers give better service, but it's a possibility to say, you're going to work directly with me. I care about you. I'm not like a big corp where you'll have to work with managers and stuff like that. I care. I listen and I implement your your work. And so being small, being nimble, allowing you to charge less, it's still super profitable for you as a, as a freelancer. You know, when I charge $20,000 for a website, for me, that's super profitable. But for the client, his alternative if he'll go to an agency is paying $200,000. So for him, that's also very cheap. So, you know, being more affordable, giving better service, doing things faster and working directly with a client is probably your best point that you should mention when trying to convince them why to work with you versus an agency. But as I said initially, a lot of times you're not even competing with agencies as a freelancer. Next question, what do you say to a client when he asks for something not including in the scope of the project? This is where proposals and contracts are very, very important because you really want to clarify what's included in the project and what's not included in the project. And usually I'll have a term in my terms of my proposal. I don't send separate proposals and contracts. I just send a proposal and I have my terms in the proposal. And in the proposal, I, I usually say something that if you need additional scope that is not included, we're gonna do a separate proposal for that. If you just need an extra iteration or something small, usually we'll, we'll do that on an hourly base and not send a whole new proposal if it's just something minor. But if they actually need a whole separate thing that we did not cover before and it's not covered in the proposal, then we need a separate proposal for that. Once you clarify that in the proposal, it's pretty easy to say to your client, look, here's what we agreed on. This is not part of it. We need to create a new proposal for this new scope. And that's that's totally fine. And a lot of, to be super honest, a lot of projects, web projects and, and product design projects in general, it's really hard to define the scope when you're starting with. So a lot of times you'll have to adjust the proposal or create new proposals or switch to an hourly rate at some point where you just need more work than was originally designed. That's just how things are. Next question. Man, how did you perfected your typography game? So here it is. First of all, it's a lot of practice. Typography is kind of a technical craft that you really have to work through. Now, how do you practice a lot? You find yourself an excuse to do something over and over again. And I did this multiple times throughout the years. So initially, like five or six years ago, I had a personal project. I developed an app that was a quotes app. And I kind of designed uh, a typographic quote for every day that showed up kind of animated nicely on your app. That app doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was called Muse, but however, for I think like a hundred days I've created every day kind of this typographic quote, which forced me to check out new typefaces, try new layout and try to rearrange text in a new, interesting and meaningful way. After I did this, I actually had the new school blog where on the new school blog for every post, we actually also created kind of a typographic poster with the name of the post. So again, for probably like a hundred or 200 posts, I don't remember how many posts we had there. I designed each of them personally. Um, 
and so I did have a lot of practice and this is something that you just need to work a lot and those practice can be a great way for you to create a side project or to create content on your social social networks so just find an excuse to start producing a lot doing a lot of composition trying new uh, typefaces just doing a lot this is something that you're no matter how many tips you're going to read about it no matter how many books you're going to read about it you have to you have to grow into these sensibilities where you understand what's the right size, where you understand how to, you know, align it, how to space different typographic elements. So it's just a lot of practice. So find yourself a way or a game or a challenge to make yourself practice a lot and that will help you perfect your typography game. All right, that's all the questions for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to follow up on Instagram and send your own questions and I will see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.